millions of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, and with me, as always, is a guy who never gets information about bears wrong, Mike (laughs) Vandebogard. Thank you, and uh, he's our co-host, Joey Rado. He had a little... What did I say? You just forgot your name. What did I say? You said, I'm the co-host, and... Oh, I didn't even say my name? (laughs) No. You know, I was reading at the same time that I was talking. I screwed it up. But uh, no, thank you uh, once again to all of our loyal listeners for tuning in. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements here. We I'd like to get to our Patreon supporters. Well, and we have to introduce our special guest, Andy. He's coming oh, back to yes. the studio. Andy is back. Yeah, I should have. We should have probably went over all this beforehand, but you know, in the in the <laughs> earlier days, we probably would have just stopped and re-recorded that. But no, not anymore. We'll just keep going. Yeah, but roll to punches. Yeah, this is our third episode on Gwen Hasselquist. So Andy is back uh, in the studio. <laughs> Thanks so, for having me back, boys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so just the whiskey comes out when you come back. So it's, it's, it's a fun time. So, uh, yeah, just a quick shout out to our new Patreon supporters. So Samantha Porter, Christopher Stiles, Angel Osorio, uh, Cindy Lindsay. And this was pretty funny as I, we were typing these into our show notes, uh, Heather Johnson just, uh, supported the, the page. So thank you, Heather, uh, for, <laughs> you're like a part of the show. Yes. Like we were prepping for the show. <laughs> Mike's phone lit up and goes, Oh, we just got a patron supporter. I'm like, <laughs> add her to the list, quick. <laughs> so uh, thank you. And uh, like we say every episode, if you want to call our phone number and leave a really funny voicemail or a mean voicemail or a review for us, just call 208-391-6913. Yep. Sure. Write it on toilet walls and yes. bathrooms everywhere. Call everywhere. It. Call it. Um, So this one's going to be a little bit different because what we're going to be doing is playing an interview that Mike and I already did about a week and a half ago. Uh, We interviewed Gwen Hasselquist's best friend. So we're going to be playing you that interview. We needed some time to cut out some of the things after we recorded it that she felt was either irrelevant or she didn't want aired. Uh, So we're going to play that interview and what we'll do is either come in and comment or just listen through certain parts. So we'll jump right into that. All right. And um, Mike and I did the interview for Andy. This is the first time he's hearing this, so he's pretty excited to find out what was going on. All right, here we go. To start, could you just give us your name and your connection to Gwen? Okay, so my name is Donna, and um, Gwen and I met in high school, and we were friends for 30 years. So we met when we were 15. Okay, and is, was that high school in the Gig Har- Harbor area? No, actually, we both um, went to high school in Ohio. Okay. In a real small town in Ohio um, called Conneaut. And we were both brand new students um, our sophomore year and happened to sit next to each other and just became fast friends really quickly. Throughout the years, how often would you say you would meet up like in person or at least talk to her, you know, via phone or email? Right. Um, we, um, after high school, kind of went in separate directions. Um, she moved out to um, Texas and um, was originally planning on going to nursing school out there. I stayed in Ohio and went to college there. So we sort of, you know, through the years, kind of lost track of each other and found each other again. Yeah. And um, But we would talk to each other, you know, on holidays. And if I would go, I had moved to California once I graduated from um, college, I moved to California and when I would come back to visit my family, I would always go up to Cleveland cause her family lived in Cleveland and that's kind of where she was based after she moved back from Texas. And so I would go and visit her in Cleveland when I, when I came home to visit my family, she came to Virginia cause when I moved to Virginia, she came to Virginia to see me. 
<clears throat> a couple of times. But once like social media sort of took off and we were able to keep in touch like through Facebook and, you know, we could text each other, it got a lot easier. And I would say like, we probably, you know, communicate in some way at least once a month. The last time I, I saw her was in 2016. Okay. So how much did you know about Eric and when she got married to him? Were you close then? Did you go to the wedding? How did that all work? I did not go to the wedding. She lived with her parents for a little bit. Then she moved out from living with her parents and she moved into an apartment. I think she lived on the top floor and he lived on the bottom. Like they, it was like a two, two uh, level apartment and she lived on top and that's how they met each other. They were neighbors. I remember when she met him and she said, I met this guy and I really, really like him. Then kind of, I don't know how long it was after that, that then they ended up getting married, but I don't think anybody was at their wedding. I think they went to Vegas and got married, just the two of them. Gotcha. Okay. What year were they married in? I don't remember if we knew that or not. I do not know, actually. Like 14 or 15 years ago. Okay. Because their their oldest son is 12 or 13. Yeah, and I believe based on messages in that group, uh, the Find Gwen group, that their kids are actually in Wisconsin somewhere with family. They are. Yeah. yeah. They're in Wisconsin with his family. Okay. Yeah. So what we did hear from some people and I'm going to paraphrase just cause I don't want to again, give away information that I was asked not to that. I'll just say there were some issues in the relationship throughout the marriage that seemed to continue to get worse as that was happening. Is this something that Gwen ever reached out to, to talk about or things that you knew that were going on that were something that would, rub you the wrong way or or make you think something was going on with their relationship? No, to be perfectly honest, I did not know anything about anything that was happening, you know, in a negative way between them. She never, ever let on one time to me. Um, Like I said, we met in 2016. We have a mutual friend that lives in Seattle. And so I went out to visit and she came from the Tacoma area up to Seattle to, um, to visit. And I hadn't, I, I'd met Eric a couple of times, like maybe twice before that, um, in Cleveland. And he seems perfectly fine and really nice and, you know, friendly. And when I went out there in 2016 and we met there, he was like a totally different person. Um, he had joined the military and, um, was I think playing in the military band, like in the army band, he, he looked totally different. Like he's a thin, small kind of framed guy anyway, but he was like obsessively running. And so he said, uh, literally all he could talk about was running about his fitness and about how he, his nutrition and how fast he could run and how many miles he could run. And he actually even left the group we were all staying together and he left her there with her kids and went running. Cause he's like, I have to get my 17 miles in today. And it was just like a really weird, that was the first time I was like, what is with him? Like he's really weird. Like, and my other friend that we were visiting, as soon as they left, we both were like, what was that? Okay. So it was, it was odd enough that it, it like you both noticed it. There's something odd. It wasn't just like, Oh, I work out in the mornings. I'm going to go for a run. No. Was it like trying to impress you or was it just like he was so deep into it? Like he needed to do it. Yes. Like he was obsessed with it. Like he was completely obsessed with it. And she seemed a little bit off too, like, like sort of sad and sort of like she had had some medical issues. Um, I know you guys talked about the, um, she had an autoimmune problem with that like affected her lungs. And so she was like, I mean, I think, you know, she was, we were happy to all be together, but I think she was like feeling a little bit, she wasn't feeling great and he was being super weird, but it was like enough that when he, they left, my friend and I were like, what just happened here? Like he's totally different. When was that roughly compared to when uh, she initially was missing? Was that a couple years before then? 2016, I went to, to visit and then after that, like we still kept in touch after that, you know, um, and she had had like some kind of lung problem that she had to have some kind of medical procedure maybe a year after that. And I remember her parents came out to take care of the kids because he 
was traveling or something and she needed help taking care of the kids. Let's go a year out before she went missing and ultimately was found, um, passed away. Did, were there, did you have any communications with her in that period, that like final year that started to make you worry or. So <clears throat> that's what I was going to say. Like, fast forward, like another, I don't know, another year, maybe November of 2019 mm-hmm. out of the blue in November. Like I get a phone call from her and she's like, Hey, I need to talk to you. Like, okay, what's going on? And she says, um, well, Eric's drinking again. And so, and he's suicidal. She's like, Donnie has a gun and he's running around outside. And every time I try to call the police, he says he's going to kill himself. And I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, hold on. (laughs) What does that mean? Drinking again? Like what, you know, so this is the, this is the first time that you're like aware that he had any issues at all. I had no idea. Okay. She has never one time mentioned it. I had no idea. So this was like a, wait, what? <laughs> so she had been trying like to get him help. And every time she reached out to, you know, try to like call somebody to help her, they would say call 911. And anytime he said, you know, that he thought that they were going to come to the house, he would take his son and go outside and tell her you're, that you're doing this to me. I'm going to kill myself. And so there were weapons in their house, like loaded weapons in their house all the time. Um, And by this time they had moved. So I don't know where they lived before, but I specifically remember that they moved to a place. She sent me pictures of it. This when, when she purchased this hat, when they purchased this house and it was like, it's out in the middle of like in the middle of the woods and in order, it's completely surrounded by trees. You can't really see their neighbors. And I was like, wow, it's like very secluded. And she's like, yeah, you know, I mean, it is a little kind of far away from people, but you know, Eric kind of likes it that way. And I was like, okay, that seems creepy, but okay. <laughs> Wouldn't it be for me, but that's, you know, and she was excited. She was like going to grow a garden and she was like super excited about that. So she was like happy or at least portraying it as, you know, happy. But so when I got this phone call in November, I was like, what in the world? Did she explain like what it might've been from, or she just kind of blindsided you with this whole thing that you didn't know anything about? No, she just said, well, she said he's been an alcoholic for years. This has been going on for a really long time. You know, she's like, I just never told anybody. And I've been, you know, trying really hard to like hide it or keep it, you know, just in our family. So she's like, nobody really knows what's happening. She said, he won't, he won't let me talk to my family. He won't let me talk to his family. I can't reach out and talk to people about it. So like, I just got really scared for her. And I was like, you know, what do you need? What, what do you need me to do? She just said, I just need somebody to talk to. Okay. So she was like at her wits end. Yeah. Like, okay, I I've tried everything. I I can't do this alone anymore. Yeah. This definitely lines up with several other people we've talked to about him. And I I believe he was even discharged from the military over drinking issues domestic violence kind of issues. Like Mm -hmm. I think there was a couple of times that he was physically abusive to her, but also like emotionally all the time. Yeah. And the the thing about running, she said he stopped drinking for a while, but then he started like obsessively exercising. So when we saw him in that one time when he was like, that's all he could talk about is that was like his replacement behavior. She must have that there was some, and she told me that he left the military because he didn't like it. And I was like, all right, I don't know anything about the military. Like, okay, I guess we do that. <laughs> I don't think they let you do that. Um, but it, yeah, I, I agree with you. It sounds like he, he replaced one addiction with another. So maybe he has like that addictive personality. Yeah. And we tried getting police records from November, December timeframe prior to her mm-hmm. disappearance about specifically domestic abuse issues at the home. And we mm-hmm. were at least, at least still unable to get that through FOIA requests. So that's definitely yeah. corroborated from, from other people. Yeah. I, I mean, I did not know like anything that was happening until that moment, but I'm telling you that I hung up the phone when I got off the phone, I said to my husband, like, this is going to be bad. Like I really am super scared for her. I just, in my mind, I picture like I just had this like vision of it being like a murder suicide. Like he's just going to kill her and he's going to kill his family. And like, I go, we're going to see this on the news. Like this is going to be terrible. 
And my husband's like, I mean, you're kind of overreacting, don't you think? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I just feel really like very uncomfortable with this. Like this makes me very nervous. And I could, cause she would not ever reach out to me to share that stuff with me unless like she just felt like she couldn't handle it anymore. So sure. like, I know it had to have been really bad. So I like made it my mission to just, I was going to connect with her like almost as many times, like every day. Like I, I want to hear from you. Cause if I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume that something bad has happened and that, you know, and then I'm going to start calling people and it's going to get weird for you because yeah. people are going to start showing up at your house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, so, I mean, that's being a good friend. It's, yeah. I think most people would maybe go, okay, it's not a big deal. It's none of my business, but uh, so when, so you started contacting her regularly, what were those calls yeah. like um, leading up to the incident? The, the funny part about that was every time she would call me was like in the car, like picking up her kids. Okay. And then she'd be like, I got to go. So she was getting home or he was like in the room. So she, she didn't like talk in front of him or anywhere near him. Or as soon as the kids got in the car, she got off the phone with me, but I texted her like all through the holidays. And she kind of made it sound like things were getting better. And she was like, you know, it's been better. It's okay. Cause I was thinking to myself like, Oh gosh, Thanksgiving weekend, they're going to be home the whole weekend. Like that could be really bad, you know? And she was like, no, it seems better. And I was like, okay. So time kind of went on and she sort of said things were getting better. So I was kind of like, okay. Was she at that state where she would have been honest with you if they weren't? I don't know if she felt like it was getting better because I didn't sort of like hear that nerve that like, I didn't hear that like panic in her voice okay. anymore, you know? So she sort of made it sound like things were going better. Yeah. And if, if you want to speculate, you can just say, Hey, I'm speculating here, but this is what I think based on, cause it's, it's, I'm sure you could tell if you knew her that long, you could probably tell like a crack in the voice or the way she's talking if she's not being yeah. truthful. Yeah. I just, I mean, yeah, I, I, I felt like she was doing better because I kind of could feel myself like relaxing a little bit. Like, okay, maybe I just overreacted. Maybe this isn't, you know, like maybe it was okay. But I still felt like I needed to talk to her. So her birthday is the first week in March. I always text her on her birthday or call her every single year for 30 years. I sent her a message and I said, I hope you have a really, you know, happy, peaceful year, you know, just sending you some birthday love. And she said, um, I've had a great day and I think this is going to be my best year yet. Okay. And I like, when I think about that now, like, I just like, she really felt okay about how things were going. And she was like feeling really positive, you know, like, um, she had just kind of reconnected. I know you guys talked about like rekindling a family connection and she had just reconnected with her stepsister, Dora. They had been kind of estranged for a long time and she was super excited about seeing Dora and they had visited and we're making plans to do things. And she was very excited. Like she was, you know, she seemed really, really happy. This was um, March, 2020. Yeah. Okay. So this was like the be- March 5th is her birthday. So that was the, like, I talked to her and then March, I hadn't heard from her in a little bit. And <clears throat> it was March 19th. Actually. I texted her at night. Cause I was like, gosh, I haven't heard from her in a little while. And I just, and then, and COVID stuff was happening all of a sudden. Yeah. And I like, I'm a teacher. So school got shut down and that we were just all sitting here. Yeah. That was like fresh into lockdown. Cause my birthday is March. My birthday is March 19th. And I remember I had planned, I had plans. And then we're like, everything <laughs> got shut down. Everyone was very nervous. Yeah. Like didn't know what was happening. So I sent her a message. Cause so I was thinking about her and there was like a lot of craziness happening. And so I sent her a message and I said, Hey, everything okay? I haven't heard from you in a little while. And then I didn't hear back from her. I never heard. So then like, the, you know, the week went, went by and I'm kind of like, well, maybe I'll give her like a day or two more, like who yeah. knows what's going on. And I didn't hear a single thing until I got a phone call from Eric on March 24th. Okay. How did, how did that go? I, it's the middle of the day, right? My phone rings and it's Gwen because he's calling from her phone. Um, and I get a text message that says, Hey, Don, uh, this is Eric. Um, I just wanted you to know that the kids and I are okay and we don't need anything, but Gwen's gone and we're missing her so much. Wow. And I was like, what? So, <laughs> so what you, does that mean? You didn't see any of the social media posts or anything prior to that? No. Okay. No. What no, a, what a way to with him. break yeah. the news to one of her oldest yeah. best friends. I'm not. 
Yeah. I'm not friends with him. Yeah. So I had no idea what was happening. I, I had no, I not seen one single thing. I had no idea what was going on. I'm like, what, what does that mean? And then he, and then he puts his cell phone number. You can call me if you want. What? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really so strange. I, it's like, he's almost trying to get attention from you because like he knew you were close with her. I think he was looking through her phone and realized like, Oh, Oh gosh, she's been talking to Don all this time. Don knows all of this stuff that has gone on. I really honestly in my, I'm speculating, but in my honest opinion, I think he realized like, Oh boy, I better get in touch with her because she is going to, she's going to want to know what's going on. Yeah. And she knows a whole bunch of stuff. Um, Do you think it was like an intimidation tactic almost? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. I think okay. he, I, I don't think I would really say that. I think he was trying to cover his bases. Like he was trying to reach out to all the people that he knew that knew stuff. You know, like I got to hurry up and make sure that everybody knows I'm this good guy, this caring, loving husband. And I'm so sad and, you know, upset. So <laughs> it took me a long time to like, dialed a number. I called my other friend who lives in Seattle first. And I was like, what do I do? And she's like, well, you're going to have to call. I'm like, I don't want to call him. Like, I don't even know what this means. And so I finally get up the courage to call. And he was like, immediately, as soon as I, as soon as he could hear my voice, like started just fake crying. And I, I know for sure that he was not really crying. It was like the fakest sounding cry I've ever heard. And he was like, she did it. She just jumped off the bridge. She just, she just did it. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, she was mad at me because of COVID because she had COVID and she just did it. She, and I was like, I, I, I don't even know what to say. Like, I cannot even believe this is true. Like this is not, there's no way. He asked me to FaceTime his kids who I'd only met one time before. So I was like, I mean, okay, that seems like a weird request but like I was just like okay sure whatever like I go are you home by yourself and he said yeah I'm here by myself and in the middle of his crying I said why you need to get in touch with your family and have your family and he immediately stops his voice totally changes and he said oh I don't know if I can say this but he said my family are a-holes I'm not talking to them and, and then he went back to like just completely crying again like fake crying and I was like Eric I, I'm I'm so sorry <laughs> I mean he sounds like I mean, it, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I mean, based on all of the comments we've heard from other people and the, the things he was posting on social media, I mean, he kind of sounds like a sociopath. That's exactly what I was going to say. Oh my gosh. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The way that he can just turn emotion on and off and just the lack of any kind of, you know, like extreme antisocial attitudes and behavior and a lack of conscience. Yeah. And like a lack of, oh. like if your wife had just jumped off a bridge when you're talking to law enforcement, you would be shattered. And he like in the police report, just like a, like a stone cold, like yes. no emotion, which yes. is bizarre. I, normal people would be crying. And well, I think even normal, not, not that it, you're not important in her life, but I'd feel like if, if it happened to my wife, I wouldn't be going down her list of close friends first. Right. Within a, right. a couple days. Like unless be, you, unless you murdered her and you're trying to cover your tracks. Well, just in general, <laughs> yes. it's, you're going to, you're going to be, you're going to be around family. You're going to be around. And like her, I would expect her friends would probably show up, yeah. but I wouldn't be going out of my way to reach out to those people as the only people I contacted. So did you, I, like when you heard this, did you immediately think that it was something with him or were you, uh, just give us, yes. I don't want to lead you. Okay, I don't want to so, lead you. Tell us how you felt kind of when you got that call. I hung up the phone. I was like, I knew it. I told my husband, I was like, I told you something was going to happen. I knew it. And I have never called the police in my entire life. I didn't even know how to call the police. I got on the phone and I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to call the gig Harbor police department. And then I, I couldn't get anywhere because it wasn't gig Harbor. It was supposed, it was like the sheriff's department for Pierce County, so, I mean, I spent all this time trying to get through to somebody and I finally get like a lady and she's like, ma'am, are you trying to tell me that somebody murdered somebody? I was like, I don't know what I'm trying to tell you, but something bad happened here. Like this is some, somebody needs to go and check this out. Like that was my immediate gut feeling. 
And I'm not a person who would call the police ever. And I immediately said, like, there's something, this is not good. This is like something bad happened here. Like, she did not do this. There's no way she did this. And I, this is, before, I had not seen the video. I had not, I didn't know anything about the. Mike, our next partner, has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because, as many of you know, I got into kickboxing and was feeling slow and sluggish on training days. I was taking more supplements than I could count, and nothing was helping. One of the fighters at my gym recommended Athletic Greens AG1 Daily Health Drink, and I've never felt better. One scoop of AG1 in the morning has me ready to take on Mike Tyson by the time I get to the gym. One serving of AG1 contains 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that support better sleep quality, recovery, mental clarity, and alertness. All things very important in the world of combat fighting. Best of all, it costs less than $3 a day, which, from my own experience, is cheaper than getting all the different supplements yourself. For less than a cup of Starbucks, you can make an investment in your own health that I can personally vouch for. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. Just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you free a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com forward slash E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. The ring video, I didn't know anything about anything. This is based on her phone call to me and his phone call to me. That is it. And I was like, this is wrong. There is something wrong here. I happened to... Um, ask him because I knew she had been talking to her sister and I just said, Eric, you know, um, I, I, I just need to understand really what's happening right now. Like, you know, it's hard to understand what you're saying. And like, I, I just don't really get what's going on. So is it okay if I get in touch with her sister? Could you give me Dora's phone number? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. So we hang up the phone. He texts me Dora's number. It took me a while to kind of get up the courage because I had literally met Dora like one time when I was 15, 30 years ago. And I was like, what are the chances that she's even going to remember me? But I'm going to try it anyway. And so I reached out to Dora like, hey, I, I, you might not want to talk to me. And I totally understand. But like, I just am trying to understand what's going on. And she was so kind and called me back. And we started talking. And just in like probably... 15 minutes of me talking to her, I just said, Dora, I'm so sorry to ask you this and I, and, and I don't mean to offend you, but like, do you think that Eric has something to do with this? And she was like, yes. I mean, immediately like, Oh my gosh. Yes. And then we just started like blah, 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 talking about everything because we had so many, like so many pieces just don't fit together. Like so many things don't make sense. Well, yeah, the him getting remarried, you know, oh. a couple months after his wife of, you know, 15 years or whatever dies, we both thought originally we were like, that's insane. I've never heard of that unless somebody killed their wife and had obviously had been dating her before. Yeah. So, let, so you, we, you call, you call Dora, you're talking to her, you, you both kind of come to the same conclusion that you feel like he's responsible yeah. from that point on. Yeah. When did you start finding out about all the weird after effect things that were going on. Did you start following them on social media and seeing those posts and things like that? Um, yeah, a little bit of that. Dora was there for a lot of it. So, um, she, because he reached out to her kind of for a sort of support and Dora was like trying to help out and be there with the kids. And, you know, she kind of was like, I mean, I feel like this is really, he's really strange and there's really strange things happening and I just don't want to leave the kids, you know, with him the way that he's behaving and she knows a lot about the stuff that happened, but literally he got married. I mean, he, there was some other girl that he was supposed to be bringing to the United States, some other girl, like from some, I, I think it was like from a Spanish country of some sort. Um, and then 
like at the last minute, all of a sudden he sent Dora a message and said like, Hey, I met someone. And she's like, okay. And, um, he's like, yeah, I think we're, we went on a date. And she's like, okay. Like, I mean, this is, you know, it's like, been, why are you telling whatever. me this? Yes. Like, but it's been like a month and like, you're okay. So, and then she's like, I can remember Dora calling you. He's like, he is married. Like, wait, what? Um, and honestly, what I think is that he needed, he could, he can't function by himself. Like Gwen, Gwen kept the crazy under control. Like she held in the crazy. So no one kind of knew what kind of person he really was. And he needed somebody to help manage his crazy. And so unfortunately this poor, I, I honestly do. I don't know this woman that he married, but I honestly do think she just like, I think she wanted to come to the United States. I think she thought I'm going to marry this nice American guy. I don't think she realized that he was, you know, an alcoholic and a psychopath. And she, they went back to Kenya because not too long after they got married, her father passed away and they went back to Kenya. And when she tried to return to the United States, she was detained um, and was not allowed to come back into the United States because of some sort of, according to them, it was like paperwork that, she, and she's not allowed back in the United States for another 18 months. And I don't know how long it's been, but that's when he started writing all those posts about how, you know, F the USA and, you know, I'm getting out of this country or whatever. And honestly, he literally left his children. He, he signed over the, he signed over his parental rights and left his children and went to Kenya. That's crazy. To be with his. Yeah. He's crazy is what you're right. He's crazy. It's crazy. And even the detective in the police report that we got, and I think you've probably seen that by now too, because Dora had it. Yeah. Um, yeah. He even mentions that things don't add up, but you know, like I don't have enough evidence to really convict him of something. And I'm here thinking like, I, there's people in jail that have been convicted on less evidence. Yeah. Just let, let somebody tell the story and then just be like, what, so what do you think here? Yeah. Um, the hard part is everybody sees it, but at the moment, like in the moment when all this was happening, like the world was shut down. And the thing I remember about the detective, he's super nice. Like when I talked to him on the phone, he was really, really nice. Um, but he kept saying to us, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like really, really bogged down. There's got so much stuff to do. We have so many cases and he just like made it sound like he just, this was just more than he could kind of handle, you know, at the, at the moment. And I get it. I do understand, but, I mean, we emailed him. That poor guy probably was like, I need to change my email address because these women keep bothering me. Um, we emailed him. We called him and left messages. Like, I mean, and he ne didn't, he never responded ever. So we got one email that was like, Hey, we're working on it. And then in August we got a final, like, I'm really sorry for your loss, but it looks like it's a suicide case closed. And that was the end of it, you know? And that was like, so heartbreaking because like we all just knew that that's not really what was happening. Um, yeah, my speculation at that time, I think you, you touched on a little bit was this happened right at the height of COVID and we got to try and put ourselves back in that mindset where nobody knew what was going on. You know, it still, it took us over a year to really kind of get a grasp of how intense it was and what was really happening. But in that beginning, there was a lot of panic, a lot of confusion. And I feel like right. in normal peacetime, this would have probably been looked at a little bit closer than it was. Oh yeah. I mean, we tried, I feel like, yeah, yeah, we tried, I tried getting the video surveillance footage from the Tacoma's Tacoma narrow bridge. And I was told right. that they, the video gets deleted after a certain amount of time, um, which whatever, that's fine. But why didn't the detective pull this video? I mean, I the, don't know. The van potentially had like, even though that like homeless guy or who the drug addict or hover was on the bridge that saw the van, saw potentially another person in the van. Like we were like, what is the incentive for that guy to make that up? Well, and that's kind of, kind of what stinks is every little bit of lead that would be kind of like the linchpin in the entire case is always hinged on something that's not entirely trustworthy. So you have this individual who is inebriated, homeless, says he may have seen two people in the van. 
Uh, but then he makes some other stuff up. So you almost have to kind of get in the mind of somebody who may be on drugs or inebriated. But that always stuck with me because I feel like when people lie to manipulate, they're going to lie and manipulate in ways that will help them more so than other people. And I felt like right. the detail of how many people were in the van is an innocuous detail that you don't really need to lie about. So why would you? It just, it felt to me like they picked out and not, I'm not blaming them necessarily, but it just felt like they picked out all the stuff that makes that, that made it easy. You know, like I'll, I'll believe you when you say I saw her, but I don't believe you when you say there was another person there. Like, I mean, (laughs) and I mean, honestly, before I even knew that I never saw the police before, before we even knew that I had said to Dora, or when we were talking about it, I said, that guy's a runner, right? How far away is the bridge? Dora even drove the road from her house to the bridge. Okay. Cause we were talking about like, how far away is that? Like, is that far enough that you could walk back to the, and I was like, well, he, you know, if it's far enough, like he could run. I know how long we even looked to see because he was bragging about how fast his miles were. And I said, well, I mean, I think he could probably make it back in like, you know, not too long. He, he, according to him, he runs like a six minute mile. He could probably make it back pretty fast. And I mean, if you're adrenaline pumping, you could probably get back there pretty quick. Right. So if, so he told you he did what, 17 miles when he's running, do you feel like he was exaggerating or is that something where you believe no. where he can actually do those types of distances at those speeds? No, I, I think he really is a long distance runner and I think he really does run. Like, a, I think he really does that. So did you and Dora, like I, you said she drove the route. Did you have, yeah. did you like kind of think about it and speculate what it would have taken him to run back like in time or his uh, ability it to do so? It was only five miles away, I believe. Yeah. Well, I don't well, know as how a far crow flies, but you'd like, I, I remember looking uh, at the map and the road kind of looped around to get to the bridge. Well, Dora has a video of, of her driving from Gwen's house to the, to the bridge. She has a video. I mean, it's not like, it's not, it's not like an easy, you know, quick little, but I mean, if you're an experienced runner, like you could run, I can't even understand. This is the other thing. Okay. Gwen wore glasses. She was blind as a bat without her glasses. How did she drive? You saw the video of what she looked like when she was leaving her house. How in the world is she going to get down this windy, dark tree lined road? How is she getting from her house to this bridge? How is that happening? Like, how would you even, she couldn't even put her key in her door. Like, how do you even know, oh, I'm now going to drive to this bridge that's 15 minutes away or whatever it is. Like she couldn't even do like put a key in. The speculation, at least what Eric's story was, was she couldn't put the key in the door because she was inebriated potentially on pills. Do you feel like was her vision really bad enough or that could have been a vision thing? I mean, I think it could have been a mix of both. I know um, when I was listening, when I listened to the podcast again and they were saying like, you know, she had, or we were talking about the autopsy or the toxicology and they were talking about how, you know, she had that drug in her system, Yeah. but we don't really ever know how many, how many pills were in this bottle in the first place. Like, I, I mean, I don't know how much was in the bottle. I don't know how much was in her system. And remember, she's only like a hundred pounds. She's like a teeny little person. Well, yeah. And someone else that we talked to also mentioned that, okay, if she had taken a whole bottle of that medication, again, she wouldn't have been able to drive all the way to the bridge without no. crash totaling her car. Right. Right. I, I made a connection with a neighbor that lives down the street from them. And she's like, I, it's hard to drive that street in the daylight. You know, when, when I have all my functions, she's like, there's no way you could drive down that street. And, and it, there's just like, I don't know. It's just so frustrating. You know, and it got me thinking too, like, no, obviously we would love, we're going to keep trying to get a hold of that detective. Cause I think it'd be great to talk to him about this case, but yeah. you know, if it's still, I, it's still, I can't understand why that footage of the bridge wasn't pulled unless as a police department, like you were saying, the guy is overworked. They want to just get cases closed. One way to make sure this doesn't turn into a murder investigation is pulling evidence that would show that it was a murder. So like they know, right. the, they know the footage gets deleted after so many days and maybe they're just like, you know what? I bet he did murder her, but you know what? If we don't have this video footage, we can't, you know, bring him up on charges. 
Right. Exactly. I, I a hundred percent believe that. Okay. And also, can I just say, can I just like speculate again, just sure. um, from talking to people that Gwen was stashing money around in different places, like different banks around the area. And I believe that it, that is because she was planning on leaving. I don't know that for sure. That is pure speculation on my okay. part, but okay. she was putting money in places because she was planning on being able to like, I need to have money to survive. Like when I get out of here. And did you hear that from her or from like a source that you would deem credible? Yes. I did not hear that from her, Okay, but okay. I heard it from, I, I got it from somebody. Um, and then, <clears throat> so, I mean, it's expensive to get divorced. It's hard, you know, that's, it's going to cost you a lot of money you're, and you're going to have to pay, you know, you'll have to pay to, to support your kids. Outside of that, what you said before about he would march around outside with a gun threatening her if she called the police. So it sounded like yeah. he had a control issue. And I'm almost wondering if she, if again, we're, we're going to go down the speculation path of I'm, I'm going to trust the information that you heard. Cause what we've been hearing from people that were close to her has pretty much turned out to be accurate. So let's assume yeah. she's storing money around town and planning to divorce. I almost wonder if it's possible. She broke the news to him that night and he freaked out. I, I, it could definitely be the case. That could definitely be the case. She reached out to me for help for him when he was suicidal. I mean, so I, there's, there's just no way in my mind that she would like, she would not leave her kid with him. There is no way she would do that. There is no way she would not do that. She's a super smart person. She knows about drugs. She was in nursing. She knows about drugs and how drugs work just no way that she would do that to herself. Like, yeah, that's the impression we've been getting from everyone that's known her is there's no way she would commit suicide over something like COVID or anything, especially because she wouldn't want to leave her kids. I think it's, I think outside of let's, even if he wasn't had all these episodes, I still think like, uh, um, you know, I'm not a mother. My wife is, but a thing changes when you have children and, especially if you feel like there's a threat at home. I can't imagine right. her leaving that. And that's where I think the biggest, uh, cause I always try and play devil's advocate. I always try and really step outside of my emotional prediction of what's happening. And I think the thing that threw me off the worst was, and you said, you listen to the podcast, the part where when the detective called him to basically tell him that they found the van. And when he said, yeah. no, the van's here, she's here. Everything's fine. And then all of a sudden it changed. I think that was like the biggest red flag ever is he maybe lost control, did something. And in the heat of the moment is trying to cover it up, but is not thinking clearly yet. And is saying things that are very damning that seem very damning to us. I think I made the comment that I'm basing it off of just watching detective shows. So that's not really a good, <laughs> a good indicator, but I, I kept throwing it back. Cause I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. And I keep throwing it back to, that is obvious, but maybe not if you're a police department dealing with the initial weeks of COVID. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, I think our goal of talking with you and we've got, we're trying to get more interviews scheduled in the coming week is eventually to get this case reopened. I think if enough pressure is brought onto the police department, the local government, that maybe, you know, maybe some of the local news organizations start picking up this case. We, I, I don't know. One of our recent episodes, um, the podcast called Luminal, uh, got wind of this case, and they're they're going to start talking about it on their podcast, um, and they're reaching out to other podcasters they know to try to. And I told them, I said, spread spread the story far and wide because the ultimate goal is to get the case reopened. Because I truly think he's you know murderers walking around on the streets. Agreed. Yeah, it was, I remember when we first started looking into it, we started kind of speculating a little nervous about saying that because you don't want to just randomly accuse, but I, I haven't talked to a single person yet who hasn't made it seem more and more clear that it's, that it's that it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. I was going to say, um, Amanda, um, I think she probably reached out to you too, was a friend of Gwen's in high school. Um, and she, sent your podcast actually to a couple of different reporters out one in Seattle area and one in the Tacoma area, I think. 
So we've been just sort of like listening because we're just like, I mean, we're, you guys did the work. Like they don't, you don't even have to do anything. Just listen. Just all you have to do is listen to it. She even put it at the bottom for you. And one guy, one guy said like, oh, sorry, I can't, I can't listen to three hours worth of stuff. And he's like, I mean, but you should, you should listen to it. Cause like you would not be able to shut it off. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those stories that you see on like Dateline NBC or like, like the first 48 or, I mean, there, there's been murder cases that have had convictions with less evidence. I, I feel like, I know. Um, but I truly I, do. My poor family is so sick of hearing this. I'm, they're so thankful that I'm talking to someone else about it because like, okay, got it. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> well, and that, and that can be kind of maddening too. If it's, if you feel like there's something there and you feel like nothing's being done about it, I, I can only imagine like, and it's, it's different, but we do all these cases. If you listen to their show, it's, it's, when family members go missing and people feel helpless and that's kind of what we're getting when we talk to people is this feeling of helplessness that they feel like there's something there, but nothing's being done about it. So we need to make enough noise that at least it gets looked into at an official level. And I think this is going to do that. And and I really hope that this will, will kind of kick off a lot of times uh, when people are nervous, they need to see someone else step up and do it. And I really think that, you doing this with us will, will be kind of that, that tipping point, hopefully to have more people feel more comfortable reaching out and telling us their story and, and from their mouth. Cause I, as much as I, I'll repeat what they say, I think it is more impactful and more powerful coming from the person who experienced yeah. it. Well, I mean, I, I hope, you know, I said the right thing. I was like, I just, I just have been waiting to tell like the story to somebody who, you know, it's not my family or friends that um, kind of can't do anything to help. And I don't know which one of you said it, but one of you said, like, I, I really believe that he had something to do with it. But I will gladly listen if you can prove to me that he didn't. Like, yeah, we would yeah. even have him on the show. Yeah, I, I said that in the podcast. Yeah. If he calls in, wants to talk to me, I will, I'm, I'm going to grill him. If And when he hears this, I will grill him and I will tell him, hey, I think you did this. You need, you need to convince me you didn't and you need to do right. a damn good job because all the arrows point in the direction of you did it. And that, and that's exactly right. Like if you can prove to me that you didn't and, and this was, you know, a legitimate, you know, suicide, like I'll send him, I'll send him a bouquet and say, I'm sorry, but like, I cannot, there's no, there's, it would take a lot for me to change my mind. It would take a lot. I mean, the evidence is in my mind stacked against him. It's just, we got to get, we just got to keep getting the word out there, you know, get spreading the case message and it's starting to happen now. There's other podcasts that are talking about it. And, um, I think it's, I think this year it's, you know, probably later in the year, it's really going to, the ball will start rolling, especially after our third episode with all these interviews, we'll probably have to release, um, you know, multi parts because, um, it really wouldn't do it justice to, you know, obviously we'll cut out the pieces that you don't want said, but, um, I think your interview and I, I'm hopefully I'm talking to Dora tomorrow afternoon. Um, she will have so much stuff to tell you. She has so, because she was literally right there when the police came and, and told him what happened. Like she was right there. So she knows all that stuff. She knows everything. Okay. She's like a great person. You. I, I appreciate you guys so much. I, I can't even tell you. This like lets my heart rest a little because this has been super hard. And so I, I appreciate you doing this. So Don, thank thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, Greg. We appreciate you for doing this, and uh, let's hope we can blow this thing up and, and move that needle forward. So that was our full interview with Don. Um, and if, uh, for those watching and we do encourage people just listening, we've been kind of flipping through, uh, Instagram posts, uh, Google searches, the video they mention about Dora driving from their home to the bridge is still playing. Yeah. And, uh, this is one of the key things, um, I, I want to discuss right away cause I'm just thinking about it. So the, the theory, right? Go ahead. Oh no. So, I mean, so we're watching this video. It's what are we 10 minutes in now? It's yeah, it's gotta be. And the original theory we have the ring doorbell video was that she was inebriated on uh, pills, and which is why she had a hard time getting her keys in the door. 
which then brought up the question of how was she able to drive her car to the bridge without totaling it or crashing it? And what we heard in that interview now, Dawn said she was basically blind as a bat without her glasses, which yeah. she didn't have. So if let's assume both things are true. Yeah. Let's assume she took too many pills and didn't have her glasses. As we're watching this video, it's still going heavily forested. Yep. Uh, lots of turns. Lots of turns. Construction. No street lights on most of a lot of the roads. So you yes. got to assume it's dark because it was at night, middle of the night. Um, it, it would just be... I mean, a miracle if you could make this drive without glasses, if you're you know, basically legally blind without them, and inebriated on, you know, like, uh, what kind of pills were those again, Andy? Uh, yeah, the, or Joe, were they uh, like sleeping pills? or No. Benzodiazepine, so like a Xanax-type uh, pill for okay. depression. Um, once again, the... Go right into this the, is, go uh, right into the mic. Okay. There, there you go. go. <laughs> uh, the police report does not mention... It, it, the toxicology came back as having these in her system, but we have no idea how many were consumed, the amount of the uh, benzodiazepines in her system. And just watching this video, I mean, it it is a difficult drive, sober, and uh, I, it's hard to believe that you could do this inebriated or uh, lacking vision. No, I agree. It's... It's a mix of like deep forested roads. It's a mix of highway, the turns. Um, now this this was a little bit after, but I, the construction on that bridge was probably still going on. That, that's speculation now because this is obviously after the fact, but it's pretty close to the incident when this is also happening. That this is the the film that Dora had filmed. So this is two eh, construction doesn't start and finish that quick. Right. They seem to be pretty much in it. And then, Andy, you kind of posed the question in the middle when we were watching this, is it past? It's like, there's a bridge. Right. Like, why, if you're going to go do something like that, why go to that one? Well, and my, my next question is, um, if she took all those pills, uh, presumably, you know, assume, you know, basically to kill herself with pills, why would you then go and drive somewhere to then jump off a bridge, right? Yeah. Like, it, who do, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area of, like, psychology or anything, but you don't, I don't know that you hear about people trying multiple forms of suicide in one attempt, right? It, it's possible, but it, I, I don't see the why part. I, I'm, I'm with you, obviously. This so, is I mean, that's our, just our another forte. thing that just doesn't make sense. Um, what were you going to say, Andy? Well, I, I just wanted to back up a little bit. So this is the first time that I've heard the interview, and I think, you know, context is key to all of this. So we're watching this video right now, and it's obviously a, a, a difficult drive, but I see that it's posted from May 2020. So we're looking at this, and there, there's already questions about, like, how could she make this drive? Why are we, you know, recording this video, looking at what this drive entails? And it really signifies what we've been talking about the whole time, that not everything adds up in this case. The story doesn't seem to make sense, and there's a lot of questions out there. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I made the point of, uh, you know, the video from the bridge. Why wasn't that pulled by the detective? And I, like, I honestly think that I don't think they were on purpose doing that, but I think they probably did it because they didn't, they didn't want this to turn into a full-blown investigation. They you know, let's rule it a suicide, close it, be done with it. COVID's going on, you know, could be the black plague. We don't know what this is. Let's just close this case, get it over with. Yeah. And I don't think they realized, I really don't think they realized she jumped off the bridge right away. If you think about it, because mm -hmm. they weren't really looking in the water at all. Yeah. It, it was not until somebody else called in the body uh, at the port or where they found it, that it became that, but because they're dealing with the word of that, potentially homeless, inebriated gentleman who said he might have saw one person who gave him the van. There might have been two people in the car. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, they probably didn't even know what they were dealing with. Well, that, that video would have been live and available to get, you know, be pulled by law enforcement, I think, for 60 or 90 days. So, um, yeah. there's no excuse why, you know, 30 days later they didn't. That is it. like your big crux. <laughs> well, it just bugs me because. <laughs> I know it does. There would be no. You're way, not wrong. I just that that there would your, be no way for him to get off that bridge. He would have. He would be caught on video. Yeah, running, running. Yeah, at two in the morning or whenever this was in the morning. That is very damning evidence, uh, based on all of the other statements that he made about how 
you know, she left on her own and this and that, like that would be, I mean, you're the lawyer here, but that would be pretty <laughs> significant evidence if they had video of him running off the bridge. I, I, I think that would be yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, I don't think you have to be a lawyer to know that no. one. Running away from the scene of a crime. Yes. When you but, said you weren't there. Uh, and this is the some of the value from Dawn's interview is she was here during all this, right? She was an active part of what's going on. And she said she had communications with the detective. And we came to this case, you know, years after the fact, and we're speculating. We all know what it was like in the mm-hmm. immediate aftermath of COVID. But she had conversations with the detective, and everything was shut down. It was crazy. They were bogged down in work. And it just doesn't seem like something that's tied up, uh, tied up very well from a police investigation. Yeah, we we speculated that in the other episodes of like here's here'd be a camera going through a toll booth. Yeah. Like you would clearly see who'd be driving the car. Yeah, absolutely. And if Don or if uh, Gwen was really oh, inebriated six dollar toll, holy cow. Or, or blind, you would see Eric driving the car. Or like her not only her ability to get there. Uh, like pay the toll, not yeah. crash into the stuff. You know, those tolls, they narrow. Yeah. So you can't get around them. And you don't, so riddle me this. It looked like a toll booth was had an attendant, right? Uh, Well, go back. We have the power of reverse. So this is another thing. If I was a detective, I would have done. Um, Oh, not far enough. Here we go. Let's so see. So maybe it's like in Illinois. There's have, booths. No, there's booths. So you've got to maybe there could. Well, you know what? Here we go. I can do this. Let's see if she talk, talks to somebody. Hi. Yep. Yeah. She's, she's talking to a person. So, so yeah, are these are these toll booths manned in so, the early morning? Uh, mute that. So sorry. You know, <laughs> um, so if there was a toll booth operator working at the time, and this woman pulls up completely hammered out of her mind. Yeah. And can't see, can't see on pills. Don't you think they would have mentioned something or would have called the, the police and been like, Hey, uh, this lady, because they would probably just assume she's drunk or like, more importantly. Um, Hey, last night a van got up here and some like, did you see this van? Like who worked last night? Yeah. Interview those individuals. Did you see this car come through? Were there two people in it? Was there one because person? Do they seem inebriated? They're probably trained or at least told if you see somebody that's drunk come through the toll booth, call the police because they're going to, you know, scoop them up for drunk driving. Yeah. That seems pretty reasonable. Now, if someone else was driving the van and Gwen was just in it, perfectly normal situation, you wouldn't think anything else. Mm-hmm. So that would be another area. If I was a detective, I would have gone and asked like who was on shift last night working the toll booth. Like, yeah. Did you see anything strange come through at, at this time? Like well, that seems very basic detective work. <laughs> and I think, you know, one thing to note here and Joe, you kind of brought it up while we were playing the interview is that we had been operating under this assumption that she took a bottle of pills and drove to the bridge, right? We saw this video that came from, I think it was a Facebook post from Eric, but the only thing we have confirming that is the police report, which does not speak to the amount of the benzodiazepines in her system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now we know that she wasn't uh, able to see she was leaving without her glasses. She might have not been intoxicated at under pills at all, right? So we yep. need to kind of peel back these layers and, and it's start absolutely from a possibility. square one that maybe her inability to fit the key in the lock and, and kind of swaying is uh, vision issues and uh, not intoxication, not uh, some sort of a suicide attempt. Um, and well, we, and if she got in a fight with her husband, not only vision issues, she's upset. So you go outside, if she's been crying, she can't see, doesn't have her glasses, she's just in a whatever. Um, and I think what's important is it's, it doesn't, see, and everyone says this, and I'm not going to give anything away because we do have Dora's interview that we're going to do next. So there's a lot more information in that one that I, I'm trying to not <laughs> not introduce um, just because it's not the right time. But why would she pull the trigger on doing this to herself now? Yeah. What occurred? Because everything we've been hearing from her friend is that things were getting better. Things were Things were looking up. Everything was getting better. She loved her kids. She would never leave her kids. All those positive things that we're hearing about happen right before this incident. Usually when people do something like that, there's a slow decline or they've been in a mental state for a long period of time and they finally just do it. 
everything points in the direction that she was going the opposite direction in a good way. And then all of a sudden this happens. Yeah. I mean, based on this interview and the other interviews we have obviously done that we haven't released yet and comments and messages with people, I do not get the impression at all that Gwen was in a suicidal state before her death. That's, yeah, that's based on close friends, family, uh, her social media posts, um, just, you know, everything about her does not lead me to think that. And you, a lot of times on our other episodes, we say that and we don't really, we don't really know their personal life. We, we don't have this much insight into We it. have a lot of insight into Gwen's final few years before her death. And I, I 100% don't think she was in a suicidal state. I think maybe, well, you know, I'm not going to speak I think it's but. possible, but all the indicators point to highly unlikely. I think it's possible where someone can do that and it's uh, it seems out of the blue. I yeah, and I think I think Dawn mentioned too about how Eric, you know, seemed to be able to turn emotions on and off in a drop of a hat. We've got all of these crazy events going on in the past where he's waving guns around saying that he's going to kill himself. Yeah. And I think you factor that in. I think you factor in the video of her not being able to get the key in the door. Then you look at this video, to the drive to the bridge and the toll booth. I just, I, it's, it's a long drive. I don't but think for a long she, distance yeah. runner doable. I don't think she was driving now that I'm it's, it's I've seems to that very point. difficult. I think something either happened to Gwen at her home and she was transported to the bridge or she got a ride from someone else to the bridge and then something happened on the bridge that's why it's so frustrating. We don't have any of the video footage from the bridge. We don't have statements from the toll booth operators. Um, and Dawn made a great point about how they believed that homeless guy about the fact that Gwen was there, but then they don't care about the fact he said there was also possibly someone else in the car. Yeah. That, how? I mean, it's almost like they were trying to not collect evidence you're really on the, the you're really on the they want to close the case train. I mean, why else <laughs> why else would you not do some of this basic detective work? I see that's I'm nicer than you on this one. <laughs> I'm not nice on other things. I think uh covid fog. I think cuz again, I try and put myself we are in cuz I if I'm recalling properly like Washington state. That was the was like center. it was like Early. the first few cases were coming out of there. People were panicking and this is yeah. where I became less anxious about it as we went on after they found out like, Oh, if you're healthy and young, still dangerous, but way better in those early days. It's like, okay. Uh, First uh, month or two is, Oh, it was like, scary. nobody knew it was going to happen. Yeah. Nobody knew how, like it was at that point, like it seemed like mortality rate was like 50%, like something crazy. That's what it felt like. So you have these police officers that they're people too. We're going to go like, there's a body floating. Their car was on the bridge. The only witness we have is one guy. The one other, the husband's at home. It looks like a suicide. But if I, you're if you're not digging into it yeah. like we did, and if you're in the beginning of COVID, there's a lot bigger stuff going. They're probably getting calls all the time from people freaking out. True. So, if, if I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, this looks clear cut. If you don't dig into it, she took pills. She looked upset on a video. Yeah. Left. The husband seems a little quirky. If you're just taking initial statements, yeah. okay, he's home. I called there. He said he was there. There's a van. A weird homeless guy said she saw a lady fall off the bridge. There might have been another person. And, and then the and body's in the water. We it's, have the it, <clears throat> Guess what? Right there, all that information? Yeah, it sounds like a suicide. Yeah, and we have the benefit of being able to focus all of our time and effort on this case. Exactly. And they're focusing on lots of different murders and well, suicides. Or and if it wasn't COVID, yeah. maybe they would have dug in this deep. Maybe it wasn't. They didn't have so much going on, but with that going on, I, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that it was probably chaotic. I, well, and another thing to think about here is that we have the benefit of what happened after her death and after they had ruled this a suicide. And mm -hmm. we look back through the social media posts and saw, you know, his posts on, I'm looking for a woman. I feel like a man standing on one leg in the marriage three months after. Uh, while they were investigating this, none of that had happened yet. So we are we kind of backed into uh, this seems a little suspicious. But what, another thing that's interesting to me from this interview with Dawn is um, she has the same suspicion moving forward. And, it, it, you know, long-term friends with Gwen. We all have friends from high school that we're very close with but have moved apart and, you know, communicate those couple of times a year. And if one of your friends texts you and says, this is going to be my best year yet, 
and then the next thing you hear is that they've committed suicide. Uh, that's red flags across the place. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great point because it's not like she wasn't being 100% honest with her the entire time before that message. Because there are friends you have that are maybe good friends, but more superficial. You're right. not going to come to them with your dark stuff, the things that you need help with. Yeah. She was talking to her well prior to this about the dark stuff. She was talking to her through her worst times. And to your point, she messaged she's like, oh my gosh, it's getting good. We got the new house. We're in a wooded area. It's going to be the best year ever. And yeah. that's when she does it because it should have been in October or November or when we heard that there's domestic stuff. That was the deepest, darkest part. That's when someone who's actually going to do suicide probably would do it when they're at their lowest. Right. And she was coming out of that. And, and that's what doesn't add up. The other red flag that jumped out, you know, first time listening to this interview, and this is news, I think, across the board, is that uh, Dawn had heard that Gwen was moving money around, that she was putting money in different banks. And, mm -hmm. the, you know, the speculation is, uh, well, we don't know, and we don't want to speculate, right? But uh, that's another Well, you flag. don't. You're a lawyer. You shouldn't speculate. <laughs> I can speculate. <laughs> I'll speculate all Go day. ahead. <laughs> well, and she did say, and I think that's fair. I think that is fair to put the disclaimer on, and she even mentioned it. She heard it third party. So Gwen didn't tell her she was doing it, but she said she heard it from someone who's a credible source. So right. let's assume... Again, now we're speculating, but that's someone who is a close friend to Gwen in Gig Harbor, potentially. Somebody that's close enough to know that uh, maybe it's a credible source of if she's hiding money places, it's because she's fearing something or she's going to make a move. Again, if you're going to commit suicide, why would you hide money away from potentially yeah. getting to your children uh, <clears throat> or, or the people that might need to use that to... Go and on. it's a little strange. I believe she mentioned that there was speculation that she was maybe planning on leaving Eric and around this time. And sure enough, she ends up, you know, dead from suicide. That also seems a little coincidental. Yeah. Did she announce it that night or say, you know what, this marriage is over. We're done. Yeah. And he lost it. And he's, he's a normally, control freak. I think yeah. we've learned that he wants control. I think a control freak, obviously... We know about the drinking issues, and obviously there appears to be some mental health problems with you know the waving the gun around and all that. If it was a normal individual and their wife told them they're leaving them, I wouldn't assume. And then something happened to them and they died, and none of this other stuff had happened. I would probably just like, that was just a sad coincidence that she told them that she was leaving and then passed away. But when all of this other stuff happens, and then there's speculation that she was about to leave him and then she ends up dead. That seems very strange to me. And yep, again, I if I was a detective, I would probably dig into that more, but this is after the fact, I don't know what it would take to reopen a case. And obviously you can't, you can't like stuff on social media. Like you can't, I mean, it's gotta be like, what do they say? Like the smoking gun or the bloody knife. I don't know. I'm sure there's lots of detectives. There's just like, really furious at everything we're saying about this type of stuff. But uh, it, the reality is we're coming at it from uh, just a normal citizen who is taking in all the facts and it doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense why it wasn't investigated further. Other than the only caveat is we had this crazy thing called COVID going on, yep. which is a very plausible reason why things happen the way they did. And like I said, I, I always have to put myself in the mindset of right at the beginning because we, we I would look love at to it have now. The detective come on and yep. explain his reasoning for why these various things didn't happen. Like why didn't the toll booth people get talked to? Why wasn't the video pulled? There may be very explainable or reasons. Maybe they didn't have toll booth people because of COVID. Maybe they just left it open. Yeah. Maybe it was, I would like, yeah. I mean, I'd like to know if there'd still be video footage. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I've, we, we could probably call the I've, toll I've, booth people out of the state I've department at the DOT. And, and I ran th I've run through toll booths in Chicago, and you get a letter in the mail with your a picture of you in your car with your license plate yeah. saying, like, you didn't pay the toll. You're supposed like, to pay those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I paid it eventually. But I, I think this all highlights the importance of what, what you guys are doing right here because we have the police report, and we know – the steps that they went through and we're looking back, right? Hindsight's 2020, obviously, mm -hmm. but now we have Dawn's interview. I know you have more exciting information to come out that you've been able to unearth. And, and we're looking at this story from a different light that just wasn't present in 
April and May of 2020 when, when this investigation was going on. Yeah. So I think, uh, again, thank you to Dawn for yeah, absolutely. sitting down with us. We're, we're still in contact with her. Um, the thing that the every, the, the, the thing that the, you know, binds all of these people together is they want justice. Mm -hmm. They all really love Dawn or Gwen and they all feel like we do. They're just shocked that this happened and nothing happened afterwards. Like no one. Well, and we're not even related, but I, I think we, I mean, Andy, you brought this to me on a whim because you became kind of obsessed with it because of what you saw. Absolutely. And you're not related. So right. it's a ma- so you can only imagine how these people who care about her like directly feel family members of her feel like they feel like something needs to be done, something's not happening. So we've been getting the overwhelming response of they're so glad this is happening. You know, Dawn mentioned it. She's like, I, I can't tell my own family anymore because she's been talking about it for two years. Yeah. And I've felt helpless before, and that is that can eat away at you like crazy. So that's to us. We look at it as if we can use this platform to really shine light on this, catapult this to the front, uh, and potentially get more news outlets and in, ultimately, involved. The end goal is to get the investigation reopened. Yeah, I mean, you just want a second look at it. I, I throw it out to the listeners. Yeah. We have a lot of people listening to the show now, which is awesome. Um, out of all those people, if you know people that are in news media or whatever, this is a this could be a big story because it is potentially a murder that is going completely unsolved as a result of COVID. Like I said, I'm not I'm not as mean as Mike is. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say it it was a very convenient time for all of this stuff to happen. And if you're going to get away with a crime, that was the time to do it. When the entire world was disheveled, that to me is like, what a lucky opportunity and to, I'm not, to have something where someone might not look as closely because of everything else that's going and on. And I'm not being mean to I know, I'm the police you, department. I'm giving you a hard time. No, I'm just bringing up valid questions I have. If I was a close family member, I would have asked those exact same things. Like, all right, did you talk to the toll booth operators? No. Okay, why not? Did you pull the video from the bridge? No. Okay, why not? Did you investigate further once you learned of all the other, you know, things that happened around Gwen in the last couple of years. Okay, why not? Like, I would ask those questions if I was a close family mm-hmm. member. And I'd be really mad if they didn't dig deeper into that. Yeah, and, and I think you have a good point, Mike. So when we, I think the first episode, maybe even the second episode, we were looking at this. We had uh, Gwen's obituary and no family was mentioned. And now we have a maybe a little bit of reasoning for why there was no family mentioned. And mm-hmm. our speculation was, well, hey, maybe no one's putting pressure to, you know, get answers to these questions. Now we know they were. And it was mentioned in the police report. And you guys are digging up the answers to the questions, right? Yeah. And he speculated just a tiny bit at the end and just said, I've informed any family to bring any information forward. And maybe as a detective, he's got rules that he has to abide by. He can't just go around and do the speculating that we might be able to, because we're a podcast show. He's got to have hard evidence. And And everything is just shy of that hard evidence. Okay. I got kind of a witness it's a homeless guy who's completely inebriated. And most police departments are taxed to the max on caseloads. And they don't have the time. Or without re- COVID. Without COVID. They yeah. don't have the time or resources to dig back into old cases they've closed. Especially, this isn't like a murder ca- case that they closed because they couldn't find a killer. They closed a suicide. Yep. So they, they don't have the resource. I mean, there has to probably be very, like, a smoking gun to get them to reopen it. I think on its surface level, it looks like a suicide. If I'm being fair, it's, we found the body, toxicology shows benzodiazepines in the system. Granted, we didn't see how much, yeah. but you have kind of the witness saying, yeah, this lady crashed her fan and gave me the keys, and then I saw a shadow fall off the bridge. On its face, right then and there, hey, I'm sorry. It sounds and looks like a suicide. Yeah. I've got COVID to go deal with. I've got 200 other calls of people panicking. Yep. I'm worried for my life, my own family. You know, they are human after all. And if we're looking down the barrel of what looks like a huge worldwide plague, what's the mindset of the detective? He could, he, he's probably a good dude. He probably is a good detective. But again, holy cow, is everyone going to die? I need to be with my family. This yeah. looks like a suicide. I'm going home. And maybe they didn't want to interview all these people because of risk of getting COVID sure. at the time. They're Absolutely. Just like, you know what? The less contact, you know, remember they were letting people get away with speeding. They were, the uh, uh, officers I'm friends with were told not to pull cars over 
That's why the guy broke the cannonball run record. I think like, with the, all change in protocol, right? There's absolutely. Yeah, they said just and, don't engage. Don't like because everyone didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, I don't know. I think with all that said, I think if if there's even a 10% chance that a murderer is walking the streets, you can't just let that go. Well, that's why that's why we're here, Mike. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, so, yeah, I don't know. Very interesting. But, would interview. you have any closing, a- yeah. Andy? No, I think you've you've hit it all on the head. And, uh, you know, honestly, I think that uh, this is very encouraging. I know that uh, Dawn reached out to you. Uh, you've been in contact with more people. And really what's happening is the questions are being answered. Uh, you guys are getting there. And uh, it, any light that's shed on this is positive. Yeah. Uh, well, I agree with Andy. Yes, I do too. <laughs> I think we're doing a good job. And if there's any other, you know, people at Host Podcast, True Crime Podcast listening, reach out to us if you want to, you know, you know, talk about this story in your podcast. I emailed crime junkies. I was like, Hey, I'm like, you don't even have to give us credit, but this is something you might want to look into. They have a huge reach. So I was like, please, if you can do this, we like, we don't even need credit. Like just, but we'd get, like it. We, yeah, I won't, I would not take it, but I truly do care more about if this is really, uh, him doing something, getting justice for Gwen. And, yeah, and, and, it, and making sure that, and if you truly didn't do it, we want to get to the bottom of that too. Yep. And clear, all speculation. Yep, absolutely. So, well, I I will say as a as a teaser going forward, we we have another interview coming up with Dora's stepsister. No, with Dora. Or or yeah, with Gwen's stepsister. I'm sorry, I'm getting all the names. It's Dawn Dora. It's yeah. so close. Uh, but there's even different information, more information. That interview was almost two hours and then we did remove some things um, yeah. that she was not comfortable with so it's going to end up being about just the interview piece about an hour 45 an hour 50 uh, we'll be planning to record that one next we're going to let this one sit for a while uh, get people's feedback we're hoping that the other people that either interviewed with us or expressed interest that were worried about doing it will bring forward some of that information because do, outside of these two interviews, yeah. there's even more information that these two people didn't have uh, that those people were not comfortable sharing. And we've always stood by our word. We're sitting on this stuff. If they yeah. never want it out there, it's going to go to the grave with Mike and I and Andy uh, because we're not going to sell anybody out. But we hope that this uh, gets more people interested in, in sharing their story and, and yeah. the information they have. What were you going to say, Mike? Oh, um, I was just going to say, we have, I think we've got 10 more people lined up to interview. Oh, really? Yeah. That's even more than what I thought. Holy cow. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of people coming out and what's really sh- not shocking to me, but almost reinforcing it is, and I have to think of a way to say it to not reveal anything. People who you would, people who contacted us, who just based on who they were in the relationship to Eric, I thought were going to be a finally good counterpoint to everything we've been saying. And I have not gotten that out of any of them yet. Yeah, this is uh, universally across the spectrum of various people, friends, family, coworkers, whoever they are. They've all come to the same conclusion we have, which where in life, when you talk to dozens of people across the country from different... <laughs> where in life nowadays do you see consensus? <laughs> consensus. Where, yeah, different, different ages, different genders, different jobs, different relationships with the people we're talking about. Everyone has come to the same conclusion. That does not happen anymore. No. So, uh, it does not. No. <laughs> well, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of you for listening and sharing locations and known with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, we also have the YouTube channel going. So if you want to watch the video, the entire time we were recording this show while the interview was happening, I was throwing up images, videos, or things that were relevant to the case. Uh, if you want to support us monetarily, you can visit our store on either the Facebook page or at our website. Uh, you can also subscribe to Patreon or YouTube subscriptions to get access to additional content outside of our public content. And just remember when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time.